Hello everybody, uh, thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Sudarshan. I work at Yelp on their search team. And today I would like to talk to you about query auto-completion systems and how you could build one with some of the classes from Lucene. Here is a brief overview of my talk. I'll first start with benefits of query auto-completion systems. Then I will talk about different types of query auto-completion systems. We'll look at ways of evaluating them. And finally, we'll look at geospatial suggest, a query auto-completion system that I built on top of WFST completion lookup. So here is a website that I use a lot. This is uh, the web OPAC for the San Francisco Public Library. I'm a guy who reads a lot of books. And every time I come across a book on the internet, I first try and see whether it's in the library before I go to Amazon and buy it. So I end up using this search system a lot. Here is another website that I guess all of you are far more familiar with. This is Twitter. Whenever I'm not working, I'm on Twitter trying to find out what my friends are saying or what other smart people are saying. And I search on Twitter a lot. I, I, look, I search for Lucene to see whether uh, there's something exciting happening in the world of Lucene. I search uh, with Mission, which is the place I live in San Francisco, to see if something exciting is happening in my neighborhood. These two search systems have one thing in common. Can anyone guess what that is? Yeah, they don't have an autocomplete. So whenever I try to search on these systems, I, I, I feel the pain that I, I really wish that they would have some kind of autocomplete feature on them. And I try to analyze this in terms of this thing called as the Kano model. So this is a model that tries to classify the different features or attributes of a product into three categories. The three categories are basic features, performance features, and exciting features. A particular feature gets classified into one of these categories based on how happy users would be, depending on how well a particular product has implemented that feature. So let's look at an example. If you're looking at something like a hotel room, a basic feature is that you expect to find toilet rolls there. Now, if you go to a hotel room and it doesn't have a single toilet roll, uh, you're going to be very unhappy. However, even if a hotel executes very well on that particular feature and you find five toilet rolls out there, you're not going to be happy. You're still just going to be satisfied. The next uh, category of features that we could look at are performance features. So looking at hotel rooms, again, uh, uh, the size of a hotel room is a performance feature. A smaller hotel room would make you unhappy. A larger hotel room would make you happy. Uh, other examples of performance features are things like mileage on cars. So these are features with which you can very easily compare two products. The third category of features are exciting features. These are the features that you look into, look at in a product and you go really wow, like this is really cool. So I remember when the iPhone first came out and I could start controlling my phone with my fingers instead of using a stylus. And I was really excited and I was, I had the feeling that this is really something great. However, the thing with exciting features is that there is a time access to them. So after time, you find that what once excited you no longer excites you. So today when I use my iPhone, I'm no longer excited that I can control it with my fingers. I just take it for granted. So let's look at where uh, suggest falls in the Kano model. So uh, I still remember somewhere around 2003, 2004 that Google Suggest first came out. And I was really wowed by it. Like you're trying to search the entire internet, you type in a couple of keystrokes, and they are able to figure out exactly what you're trying to search for and suggest it to you. At that time, it was a really exciting feature. If you built a search system at that time and you had Suggest with your search system, your users would have been very happy with it even if you did not implement it perfectly. So in 2005, Suggest was a really exciting feature. But what about now? Today, if you look at all the popular websites that are out there, you look at Google, you look at Yelp, you look at LinkedIn, you look at Facebook, you look at e-commerce websites such as Amazon or eBay, all of them implement some form of auto-completion. 
So today, if your search system doesn't do auto completion or doesn't do it very well, users are not going to be happy. They are going to be dissatisfied. So let's look at what are the different benefits of such systems. The first two are really obvious. If you have suggest or autocomplete, your users are going to make fewer spelling mistakes. It's going to be easier for them to type keys. The third one is slightly subtle, where users can use suggest as a way of quickly exploring your search system. Let's look at each of them. So reducing spelling mistakes. Now, Ratatouille is my favorite movie. But I'm sure that most of the time, I don't pronounce it correctly. And I can never spell it correctly. Now, here I'm trying to rent it on Amazon. If Amazon did not have a suggest system, I would not be able to spell it correctly, and I would not be able to rent it. So having a good suggest system is something that can directly impact the bottom line of your company. Fewer keystrokes. Most of our users are not programmers. They type far more slowly than us. So in this example, we see that someone is trying to search for the movie Gone with the Wind. But because Amazon has a pretty good suggest system, they can type in only five characters and search with the entire title, as opposed to typing somewhere around 18 characters. This allows people to make far more precise queries more easily. This particular benefit is even more important in the mobile use case. When people are searching with their mobile phones, pressing every key is far more difficult than what it is on the desktop. So a suggest system helps people a lot more when they are doing some kind of mobile search. Now suggest as exploration. So this, this is a benefit that's, that's not really easily obvious, but I think it's also very important. So what are the suggestions that you usually present with your search system? These suggestions are the queries that have succeeded on your search system. These are actually the most frequent queries that have succeeded on your search system. So for a new user who is not familiar with your search system, Suggest provides them with a way of very easily exploring your search system without actually doing the search. So here I am at a small town in Iowa called Ames. And, I'm, and I start typing in the words PI. And then Yelp tells me that not only can I find pizza in Ames, but I can also do Pilates or go to a piano bar. So Suggest as a way of easily exploring your search system is another benefit of Suggest. Now, types of suggest system. So these are the three types of suggest system that I am familiar with. The first one is autocomplete. Then we have auto-suggest. And finally, we have instant results. Let's look at each of them. So autocomplete. These are the systems where the system uses the keys or the characters that you have already typed to predict what is going to be your final search term. And these characters are the prefix of your final search term. So going back to the example of uh, Ratatouille, the reason why these autocomplete systems work so well is that it is far easier for users to recognize something than to recall something. So it's far easier for me to recognize the word Ratatouille when it's shown to me than to recall the exact spelling of Ratatouille. So that, that's one of the reasons why autocomplete systems work so well. Now, auto-suggest systems. The critical difference between uh, autocomplete systems and auto-suggest systems is that instead of treating the characters that the user has already typed in as the prefix, these systems try to think, what are the words that could start with those characters? And then what are the different kinds of queries that you could do with those words? So a major benefit of uh, auto-suggest systems is that it allows the user to reformulate his query into something that's far more precise. So the example out here is of eBay. And uh, if you're searching with, say, GUI as the characters you have typed in, they are predicting that you're going to be doing a search for guitars. And then they are coming up with a bunch of query reformulations, like Maybe you want to search for classical guitars, or maybe you want to search for acoustic guitars. 
So these query reformulations allow users to make far more precise queries or to think of far more precise queries than they would have thought of otherwise. Now instant results. These types of uh, suggest systems have one major difference with auto completion or auto suggest. And that is if you select a particular suggestion, they no longer show you the search results page. They directly take you to the page for that particular item. And there are lots of implementations of instant result. Uh, I think LinkedIn is one, Facebook is another. But my favorite example is the one I have out here uh, from a company called Quora. And whenever I'm trying to uh, look for a question or, or add a question on Quora, I find that as soon as I type in a couple of words, I can find a question that someone has already asked and I can directly navigate to that question instead of uh, searching or adding that question myself. So those, those were different types of uh, suggest systems. So, we have looked at what are the benefits of suggest systems. We have looked at what are the different types of suggest systems. Here is a small picture for you to relax on before we move to the next part, which would be, which would be how to evaluate suggest systems. So what are some of the key criteria when you are building a suggest system? One is these systems must be instantaneous. They must order the suggestions in the way that's most beneficial for the user. They must be complete and they must be correct. So what's instantaneous or what's the meaning of instantaneous? So whenever there is like this philosophical question like what's the meaning of something, I'm always reminded of this quotation by a great president that it all depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. But, but let's look at what does instantaneous mean out here for our users. So with a suggest system, a user is typing keys one by one. And every time he types a key, we want to show him a bunch of suggestions before he types the next key. So what's the maximum time lag that we could have so that a user would think that, hey, I typed this key and I saw those suggestions? Anyone wants to guess this number? That's pretty close. So, and another interesting fact is, I actually did not know the answer to this question when I was building uh, the first suggest system that I built. And uh, it's interesting that we work as software engineers and we build products for users, but we are not aware of the human cognitive abilities that play an important role when you are building these systems. So I came across this book called Designing with the Mind in Mind, and it talks about uh, user interface principles and design guidelines in terms of human cognitive abilities. And I found that as a very useful book. I'm not related to the author in any way, but I'm still plugging it because I found it very useful. You guys might find it very useful too. So instantaneous, this book tells me that the maximum interval between events for the perception that one event caused another is like 140 milliseconds. Now here's the thing, like, if you read something in the book, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should just accept it and base your system on top of it. So, the, so what I wanted to do was want, I wanted to think whether I can come up with some kind of calculation or a back of the envelope kind of thing to validate that this is indeed uh, the time lag that I should be looking at when I'm building my own suggest system. So the way I decided to do that was to look at how many keystrokes do users enter per second. Now, uh, a common typing speed is somewhere around 30 words per minute. The English language has somewhere around five characters on the average in every word. So if the average typing speed is 30 words per minute, that means people are doing somewhere around, say, six keystrokes per word, like five for the word and one for the space. So 30 into six, that's around 180 keystrokes per minute. That works to somewhere around three, three keystrokes per, sec per second. So that gives us the interval between keystrokes as somewhere around 300 milliseconds, which makes us believe that, okay, 140 to 150 milliseconds is a good time interval for us to come back with our suggestions. Now, ordering suggestions. Now, this is an example from the book Search Patterns. And here a user is searching for uh, books. 
and as soon as he types the letters K E R O, he is being suggested a kerosene heater. Now it's extremely unlikely that when a user is searching for books, he wants to have something to do with kerosene heaters. So it's important for your suggest system to present suggestions in the list that are most beneficial for the user. And how do you do that? So the way to do that is to mine your search logs, determine what are the most frequent searches that are being made on your site, and order them in terms of their frequency. This, get, this kind of indicates that most probable suggestions are displayed to the user. Now, here is another attribute, and that's completeness. Again, uh, an example might make this more clear. So I'm searching for this book called Lady Tasting Tea. And instead of going to Amazon as usual, uh, I'm trying to go to eBay and see whether I can save some money by buying it on eBay. But the problem uh, that I run into out here is as soon as I type this, the characters Lady space TA, I don't find suggestions anymore. So now I'm faced with a choice, like do I really need or do I really want to spend the effort of typing in the remaining keys and find that eBay doesn't really sell the book? Or should I just go back to Amazon and buy it there? So if a user is going to find something on your website, it is important that you suggest that item to him before or as he completes typing out all the letters in that particular item. The last attribute I have out here is correctness. Now a suggest system should never suggest something that leads to zero results. That's a scenario where uh, users would stop trusting your suggest system. It's like I'm searching for something, I get a suggestion, and when I actually do my search, I find that the search system doesn't have that item. So at that point, should I trust this suggest system anymore, or should I just type in whatever I need to type when I'm doing a search. I don't have an example for this because most uh, popular production systems do not show this. But the way that you would run into a problem like this is if you update your search index and your suggest index at different frequencies. So an item would drop out of your search index, but it's still there in your suggest index. And then your users would run into this problem. So let's look at a bunch of metrics for suggest. So I, I remember a quote by uh, Hossman where he says that there are no right answers in search. So the corollary of that is if there are no right answers in search, to see what your search system is doing, you need to have a bunch of metrics to see whether your change has improved your search system or has actually introduced some flaws that, that, that is making it behave worse. And when it comes to suggest, there are two kinds of metrics that we could look at. We can look at search metrics, which will show us what is the impact of introducing suggest to our search system or improving suggest on our search system. And we could look at suggest metrics, which are metrics that are targeted at the suggest system that we have built. So here are a bunch of search metrics. Uh, we have quality metrics such as click-through rate, mean average precision, mean reciprocal rank. And if you introduce a suggest system to a search system that doesn't have it, you will find that most of these metrics are improved. One of the main reasons for this is that users don't make spelling mistakes, and users find it a lot easier to make more precise queries. Another quality metric that I have out here is time to first click. So this is an interesting metric that I came across on the eBay engineering blog. And if you look at uh, search systems, there is always this uh, trade-off between uh, the latency of the search system and the quality of the search results. Like, you could come up with very bad results very quickly, or you could come up with great results, but say after a minute. And even that is not useful. So time to first click measures the time from uh, when the user entered his search term to uh, the time where he actually clicked on one of the search results. And the great thing about this metric is that it combines both quality as well as latency of your search system. 
The final two metrics I have out here are uh, directly related to the suggest system that you have introduced. So because you have a suggest system which is very accurate, uh, the number of times you are going to show zero results, like someone searches on your site and it doesn't, and your search comes back with saying that there were zero hits for your search term. That thing should go down. Also because suggest systems uh, prevent uh, spelling mistakes, the number of times you are going to come up with a did you mean suggestion, that should go down. So let's look at a bunch of uh, suggest metrics. Now, these are metrics that try to determine or try to look at the performance of your suggest system individually. So suggest selection ratio. This ratio tries to determine if, say, there are 100 queries that have been done, how many of those queries did the user actually select one of the suggestions that were offered versus in how many of them did he actually do the complete search or, or typed in all the characters that he needed to type for the search term. The next two uh, metrics look at uh, how well we are coming up with suggestions that help users. So prefix length for correct suggestion. So uh, say the user is typing his search term, how many characters did he need to type before we figured out what was the search term that we could suggest to him? And selected suggest position in suggestions list. So that's when we figured out that this is the search term with which he would actually do his search, what was its position in the suggestions list when we first added it to the suggestions list? So I have a picture here which uh, explains both of them slightly better. So say we are searching for uh, the Royal Sonesta Hotel. The first time the suggest system suggests this to you is after you have typed in three characters, R, O, Y. So from the previous side, the prefix length metric that we had is three. We also find that uh, this suggestion is at the 12th position in the suggestions list. So the position in the suggest list from the previous side is 12 out here. So we have looked at benefits of auto-completion system, types of auto-completion systems, how to evaluate them. And before I move on to geospatial suggest, here's a kitten picture for you. So geospatial suggest, uh, how many of you are familiar with some kind of geospatial search? Great. So in geospatial search, we restrict the search results based on a geographical area. Similarly, in geospatial suggest, we want to restrict the suggestions that we show to the user based on a geographical area. So. Uh, we score suggestions based on how many times someone has made those kinds of queries. So in your suggestion index, say Times Square is the suggestion that ranks highest. But if someone is searching in San Francisco, there is actually no, no need to show him Times Square. We want to sh restrict our uh, suggestions to businesses or locations that start with the letter T but are in San Francisco. So I came up uh, with a simple implementation of this, and this was a try-based implementation. And what it would do was it would generate suggestions and then filter them out if they were not in the geographical area of interest. This system had a few drawbacks. One was uh, it was too slow to generate suggestions if the prefix was less than three characters. The other was the try implementation uh, did not use memory efficiently and it was a memory hog. So because I was lurking on uh, the Lucene developer mailing list, I kept seeing benchmarks like this, where people would say, uh, you can use WFST suggest and you could do prefixes which are only two to four characters in length and you could still do hundred, hundred thousands of queries per second. And I noticed that if your prefix length is small, it's computationally more difficult to generate all the suggestions. And if your prefix length is larger, 
it's it's a lot easier to generate those suggestions and the reason for this is something like how do you actually generate the suggestions you use the prefix to walk into the data structure that you have and then you have to traverse all the path from the node that you have walked into to gather all the suggestions from that particular uh, node so to fix my problem of geospatial suggest i thought that maybe i could add some kind of prefix to each suggestion that i have so that i could do my filtering while i walked into my data structure as opposed to after i have gathered the suggestions and i could also replace my uh, inefficient try with uh, the fst data structure which is far more efficient in, in terms of how it uses memory so the building blocks for this uh, system uh, were two things that i have learned at actually two different uh, lucene revolution conferences one is geo hashes and the other is wfst completion lookup so geo hashes uh, i learned about this by uh, looking at this presentation by david smiley from hi hi thank you by looking at this presentation uh, at lucene revolution 2010 i did not have the opportunity to attend it but it's a very useful presentation so what are geo hashes geo hashes are this way of encoding uh, latitude and longitude as a base 32 uh, hex string or not a hex but a base 32 string so if if you look at uh, the globe at the very first level you will have these 32 boxes and because the system is hierarchical in nature every time you add a character it breaks up this box into a bunch of sub boxes so out here we have uh, geo hashes at level 1 and 2 and we can see that we can add characters to the geo hash and zoom into a much smaller geographical area so with say a level 1 geo hash a couple of geo hashes would cover the entire area of uh, america but with one more character now you are looking at parts of california as you as you add more characters to your geo hash you can zoom into uh, even smaller geographical areas so now with two characters you are looking at california with just three characters you are now looking at uh, bay area as you keep adding more characters you can zoom in further and further so now uh, we are looking at san francisco with four characters and finally with five characters we have zoomed into a pretty small part of san francisco and for the suggest system that i was interested in building uh, this level of granularity was enough for me uh, to define the geographical area in which i want to restrict my suggestions so uh, as i mentioned before uh, for geospatial suggest most of the suggestions are locations or business names so uh, how many people here uh, know this particular place in san francisco cool so this place is uh, dolores park it's my favorite park in san francisco here are its latitude and longitude and the geo hash for this uh, particular location so how do we combine the geo hash of this business with its name so that it could be input for our suggest system so i decided to uh, restrict myself to level 4 and level 5 geo hashes and the way i did this was to take four characters from the geo hash of dolores park use a pipe symbol any symbol that was isn't a part of the characters in the geo hash would work here and append the actual name of the business uh, to this geo hash prefix that i came up with and i could do this for uh, geo hashes at multiple levels to get arbitrary precision in terms of how i could define the geographical area of search the other benefit of uh, the fst data structure is because it's a minimal fst it allows me to represent such prefixes or such suggest input in a very compact manner so let's look at how we can actually retrieve suggestions so for retrieving suggestions 
uh, what we have here is the user is saying that this is my geographical area of interest from which I want suggestions. I want suggestions for the character D, and I want the top five suggestions. So our first step is, uh, given that particular geographical area, we come up with the geo hashes that would cover that geographical area. So here is a list of geo hashes which actually cover that geographical area. The next step is to combine the geo hash with the character that the user had specified as the input. Once we have those two things, we uh, go to our WFST structure and we retrieve the top five results for the first geo hash and prefix combination. Now, WFST completion lookup has this interesting characteristic where it returns these suggestions in, in, in order. So the suggestion which scores the most would be the suggestion that's returned first. So that allows us to come up with an interesting optimization where for the first geohash letter combination, you need to retrieve all the five suggestions. But for every geohash letter combination after that, you can short circuit and stop retrieving suggestions as soon as you come across a suggestion that's smaller than the suggestions that you have already retrieved. Now, here's the reason why geohashes work so well for this problem. If you have a larger geo box, instead of using level five geohashes, you could use level four geohashes. And instead of doing somewhere around uh, 400 odd searches that you would need to do with a level five geohash, you could do only 12 searches with a level four geohash. Uh, the, both the pictures that I showed out here are not entirely accurate because it's not guaranteed that your geohash will, your, your geohashes will match the geographical area of search that you're interested in so accurately. What would usually happen is you would need to come up with a bunch of uh, different geohashes at different levels. Say you'll have to come up with some geohashes that are level four, some geohashes that are level five to actually uh, map the geographical area of interest. Now, WFST. So I first heard about finite state automata at Lucent Revolution last year. This, there was a great talk here by David Weiss. I'm not sure whether he's in the audience. But, but that talk was really interesting. And uh, if you guys have the time, you should go to Vimeo. I think there is a recording of that talk from Berlin Buzzwords. That, that, that was a really inspiring talk, and that's the talk that really uh, made me think about implementing geospatial suggests like this. Now, WFST. So, FST is finite state transducers. WFST is weighted finite state transducers. And these are a very efficient way of storing all your tokens in memory. They allow you to do operations such as get all tokens that start with a particular prefix. And if you want to learn more about them, and you definitely should. You should go to this automata invasion talk that's happening later in the afternoon. So now that uh, we have talked about the different geospatial classes, let's talk about how we could expose them via some kind of uh, web service so our Python or other language clients could just talk to them. So to do this, I used a framework called as Drop Wizard. Uh, this is an open source Java framework uh, built by Coda Hale at Yammer. It's in use in a couple of uh, companies. I think Yammer uses it, Bank Simple uses it. And it advertises itself as a very lightweight glue on a bunch of uh, very useful Java libraries. So here are some of uh, the libraries that it glues together. So there is Jersey and Jetty to deal with HTTP. There is Jackson to deal with JSON. There is snake YAML to deal with your configuration files, which are usually in YAML. And there is Guava, which helps with a lot of uh, Java programming that you need to do, especially if you have been exposed to a language like Python. So here are some of the benefits of Drop Wizard. There's no XML out there. All the object construction is explicit. It's very simple to get started with this. Like I could build the service with which I was exposing my geospatial suggest in less than an afternoon. 
And that time included the time to actually download Drop Wizard and start reading their manual. The other major benefit of this framework is that it has a bunch of very cool deployment and ops features built into it. So let's look at some of them. So a, a major benefit of Drop Wizard is that it allows you to monitor your service as it's running very easily. It allows you to add metrics such as counters, rates, and histograms. So you can count things like how many times did uh, a user do a search and I returned, or a user requested suggestions, and I returned zero suggestions to the user. You could also actually keep a rate of this to see whether the last time we generated the suggest index, was there some bug which is causing uh, the number of times you are returning zero results to dramatically go up. And the cool thing about all this monitoring is that it's very easy to add these things to uh, your code. So if I add an annotation like add time to my get suggestions method, it, it is going to keep a track of how long does this method take to execute. And just by adding uh, such an annotation, I, I can retrieve metrics such as the following uh, JSON that you see from a metrics URL which this framework also exposes. So now I can uh, figure out exactly how long my particular method is taking. The other benefit of this is that you can use something like Nagios to monitor this. So if you find that the latency of a particular method is going way up, some poor engineer out there will be woken up and will have to take a look at that. So you can also do a bunch of other things with these metrics, such as you can graph them on Graphite, and you can come up with these useful, useful charts that you could monitor them. The other uh, benefit of this framework is that in spite of having such metrics, it performs really fast. So to evaluate the geospatial suggest stuff that I built and the entire uh, service that I built with it, I uh, used an open source or a Creative Commons licensed geo data from a company called Simple Geo. If you Google for InfoChim Simple Geo, you'll find that uh, data set. Uh, I use somewhere around 12 million businesses that are in that database uh, who, which have been marked as businesses in the US to build my suggest index. I uh, did this performance evaluation using a tool called AB, and I restricted myself to uh, searching in a seven by seven mile wide geographical box centered at uh, San Francisco. So I found that the performance of the suggest system was really good, especially when I'm looking for prefixes with uh, a very small number of characters. So even for a prefix like A, which is something that my tri-based system couldn't deal with, uh, the median uh, latency is less than 10 milliseconds. The other huge benefit of this uh, was that the RAM consumption was a lot lower than my tri-base system. So with 12 million entries in it, the RAM consumption is still less than 2 GB. And, and that's for the entire system. I'm not looking at the RAM only used by the FST data structure. So here are a bunch of conclusions that I have. Query autocomplete is a really basic feature today, and every search system should have it. The WFST functionality from Lucene is a great way to build uh, custom suggest systems. And questions, if you have any. Uh, have you found any, any places where, regardless of the source of your word list, whether it's from the search index, the purpose, or from the user type, user type terms, any ways to deal with the potential of showing content to which the user doesn't have secure access? In other words, I've got a corpus of documents that have secure and insecure documents. Any way to sort of filter that and suggest time? Yeah, I, I haven't really worked with a system that deals with security issues. Uh, I, I, it's, it's not very uh, difficult to implement what you are saying in in a way that's similar to uh, 
the geohash prefix strategy that I used out here where you could uh, prefix your terms with some kind of security code and uh, when you're searching you are again going to use those prefixes to combine whatever the user has typed in. But you could ask some of the Lucene committers out here and they might come up with a much better strategy of doing that. Uh, I'm curious how you integrate this with the correctness part of the, in the earlier presentation. So someone might be searching for a category in a given geography like pizza, but it may not actually be any pizza restaurants in that geography. So how do you get the correctness thing? So how do you determine uh, what are the suggestions that you should show for a particular area? Ideally, you should show suggestions that have been search terms that have led to clicks in that area. So if, if your suggest index generation script is smart enough to do something like that, you can solve that problem. Did, uh, did you compare how large the weighted FST was without the geo prefix compiled in versus after it was compiled in? No, I didn't. Uh, it, so for the work I was doing, that, that index turned out to be somewhere around 800 MB, which was way smaller than the tri-based thing that I had built with. So at that point, I was like, I don't really need to worry about this. So it's telling either way to return additional metadata or it's basically only your query terms. So the WFS tree uh, is, the coolest part about it is that you can associate an output with your suggestion input. And this output could be, uh, a pair of uh, long and a byte sequence. So you could attach any kind of metadata that you want with your suggest input. Uh, 